Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Oregon Spring Beer and Wine Festival and on behalf of the Oregon Brew Crew, welcome to the uh, presentation on home brewing. So, before we get started, are any of you guys currently home brewers that are in the audience? None? Well, good. Good to have you. So, okay. So, I want to give you a quick little bio. My name is uh, Larry Clouser. I happen to work for a company called Brewcraft USA. Same company as Country Malt Group and Great Western Malty. We are a supplier for the breweries, cideries, wineries, meaderies, any and everything all alcohol related, including homebrew supply shops uh, in the United States and the world. So, uh, I'm also a member of the Oregon Brew Crew, which was why I was asked to speak to you on home brewing. So today, we are going to talk, we have about a 30 minutes to go over an hour and a half process of making beer. So we are going to do this as fast as we can, but hopefully I go slow enough so that, so that all of you understand me and, um, and I don't haven't lost any of you. So if there are any questions, we can, if, you, if we can hold them till the very end, uh, just for time's sake, so I will be more than happy to answer your questions either up here or at the uh, Oregon Brew Crew booth that's over there, and please feel free to stop by and, and say hi to them over there. Okay, so there's a couple things that uh, we're gonna talk about, and I'm gonna go through in the most logical order that I can this fast. There are, does, does anybody happen to know the main ingredients in beer? Water. Water's one. Oh. Hops. Barley. Barley or malt. Yeast, thank you. And we're going to do our best to cover these in the most logical order that we can in the brewing process. So for home brewing, it's actually fairly easy to get started in home brewing. Most, most home brew supply shops are going to sell equipment to get you started uh, as a kit, or you can, you can piece it out together and buy them individually if you want. Uh, but for the most part, what you're going to need is you're going to need a stock pot to get started. This is going to be used either for do, steeping your grains uh, or as a mash tun. In this process today, we're actually going to be talking about making beer that's entry level. We're not going to go over a full mash process like they do in commercial breweries or advanced home brewers will do. We're going to talk about how things have been done to make things easy for you guys. And so in this case, a stock pot this size will work just fine for you. Other things that you'll need is a, a spoon that's boil proof, a thermometer to check your temperature, this is optional, it really isn't mandatory. Most homebrewers don't start with some type of chiller. They'll typically put it in an ice bath to cool the beer down once they're done boiling. This is, this is truly optional. A, a hydrometer and hydrometer jar for t checking your gravity levels or aka how much sugar is in solution. Uh, you'll need fermenters, whether that be an actual carboy that's like this or a plastic fermenting bucket. Plastic works just fine. Uh, glass has been traditionally used on the home brewer side, but the move recently with a lot of the absence of glass is that everybody is moving towards plastic more so with food grade plastics. And then also you'll need bottles if you're going to be bottling your beer, a capper and some caps, and then you're also going to need some sanitary solution to sanitize everything because the worst enemy to beer is unwanted bacteria that could spoil your beer. There's no sense in spending all that time on making something to have it go bad. So. What most homebrew supply shops will sell is an ingredient kit. This just happens to be a, a kit that my company actually makes and supplies to homebrew supply shops. Some homebrew supply shops actually will make their own kits. Uh, I'll move this out of view so it's not blocking the view, but you, you can truly, in this box, get everything that you need to make beer, which is what we have here in front of us for the ingredients. So the first step that you would do to make your beer, first of all, is you're going to heat up water in your stock pot and you're going to bring it to a striking, well not striking temperature, I'm sorry, you know, you're going to bring it to a mash temperature or steeping temperature for your grains. That could be anywhere between 145 degrees to 155 degrees and you'll literally steep your grains. Now in this bag I've got malt, aka grain, it's, it's, it's barley that's been malted, it's a process that it goes through, and you would take this and you would put it into a steeping bag. This is a, just a I guess it looks like a sock, but it truly is a steeping bag that you would put all the ingredients from this kit into. And you would actually, once your water is up to the current temperature, you're going to put this into your kettle. You're going to fill this actually with only about two and a half gallons of water, maybe three tops to start. 
and you're going to steep your grains in there for anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes. You, you could go 45. It's not going to hurt anything to go longer, but you want it to steep in there for a minimum of 20 minutes uh, just so that conversion happens. And what we talk about when we say conversion is when the malt's in the water at that temperature, there are enzymes in the malt that get activated when the temperature is at that range and it actually converts the starches that are found within the malt to sugar and then also breaks those sugars down or helps to break them down and part of that will be the boiling process as well but it will help to break it down so that yeast can consume those sugars and make alcohol from it. So you'll steep this for about 20 to 45 minutes. Once you're done you will take your grain and most people will use a strainer and they'll drizzle water that's about 170 degrees approximately over that water or I'm sorry over that grain and at 170 degrees what it does is it stops conversion uh, it will no longer be converting the starches to sugar uh, it actually you could say kills off the enzymes at that point it, it, it destroys them and so they'll no longer be doing that and then from there you'll also want to increase your temperature up uh, to a boil at that point. Once you come to a boil, the next step is adding extract. Now all extract is, and like I said, we're, we're speaking of making beer on a simpler level rather than making everything from scratch with a large mash ton and, and, and making everything from all grain. What the maltsters will do, and this is, happens to be from a company called Breeze, they are a, a maltster that will take malt and they'll extract the sugars from it and then they boil that down and condense it into either a liquid form or a dried form. On the dried form, it's, there's no water content whatsoever so you get more bang for your buck on dried extract than you do with liquid extract. So once this is, comes to a boil, you would actually add your extract into that. Your recipe that you have for baking your beer will also give you directions on your times from there. Making beer is truly like following a recipe. That's it's all it is. If, you, if any of you have followed a recipe to cook something, you can make beer. The difference between full or all grain and using extract, it's kind of like making soup from scratch or rather than making your own noodles, you wouldn't buy some store-bought noodles and save, the pro save time on that process by using extract. It, it truly is probably the best analogy for that and how you're doing it. So by using extract, you are saving some steps and saving some time and, and costs on equipment as well. The reason why we do steep some grains is because extracts are made typically with base malt or mostly base malt. That's simple two-row, which doesn't have a lot of flavor. It could be something like a Pilsner malt, a Pell malt, or just a two-row base malt. There's not a lot of flavors in that. What gives your beer flavor, or what malts give your beer flavor, are specialty grains. So in this bag right here is a mixture of specialty grains that you steeped and the list of specialty grains are listed here on the recipe. And this will vary depending on which type of beer you're making. If you're making thing like a, something like a, a stout or a porter, you're going to be using darker grains to do that. You're still using a lot of base malt or extract for the base and very little dark steeping grains because a little goes a long ways on your dark malt. It would, if you use all dark grains to make beer, I'm not sure I would want to drink it. Let's put it that way. It would be like drinking, not necessarily a molasses consistency, but something of that taste possibly. It would be very dry and uh, unharsh on the throat possibly. So in this style, because this is actually a recipe for an IPA, a West Coast IPA, and in this one, this, th these steeping grains, to go back a second on this, is actually uh, a mixture uh, actually, on this one, it's only Crystal 40. Crystal 40 is a type of grain that, it's, it's a type of two-row barley that's been malted for a certain length of time to give it a very distinct flavor profile at 40 degree level bond. So, you'll bring this up to a boil, and you'll add your extract. You'll want to turn the, the burner off, whether you're doing it on your kitchen stove or you're using a propane burner in your garage. You'll want to turn it off, or at least take it off the burner for that time. The reason being is if you're using liquid extract, it sinks to the bottom and it will actually burn the extract if you're not careful if it's left on the burner or left on heat. On dry extract, it has a tendency to want to float and, and basically 
come to like big balls if you want to think about it. It, it. As soon as moisture hits it, it, it's like a, it turns into a hard candy and you have to stir it. So you take it off the burner to prevent any risk of caramelizing or burning the sugars that are in that because it is truly concentrated sugars and you're going to stir it up until those sugars or that or that malt or the extract has dissolved into solution. Once it's dissolved into solution, you will then return it back to a boil. Every recipe is different. In this recipe, there are actually several kinds of hops and each recipe will tell you at what time interval you will add these hops and it's typically done in a countdown. So for instance, if you see I have a recipe that says you want, you're, you're doing a 60 minute boil and add hops at 60 minutes, add hops at 45 minutes, add hops at 15 minutes, what it's doing is it's telling you at what time to add them as a countdown. It, it, you're just truly following directions at this point. Eventually, you'll get good enough to follow a clock and know what you're doing and not have to have a piece of paper nearby to, to, so you don't get lost. But in the meantime, when you start, having a recipe in hand is going to ensure that you guys make a good tasting beer and no mistakes. Uh, winging it isn't always the best way to make beer, just so you know. So in this recipe here, it has the hops added at different stages of time. And these hops, hops come in two different forms. There's, well, they're, in the brewing world it's called this, when you go to brew with hops, they're found in two forms. There's whole leaf hops, or what they call loose hops. They truly are the cone or the bud of the hop plant. And then there's a pelletized form. Most commercial breweries prefer to use pellets. Pellets have a longer shelf life. And what they've done is they've taken those whole leaf or cone hops and they've actually compressed them and then pushed them through a machine and it slices them. And they basically look like, um, like animal feed almost at this point. But it truly is hops that have just been compressed and put into a pellet form. Pellet hops have a much longer uh, shelf life than loose leaf hops. Oxygen and sunlight are, are your natural enemy to hops once they've been harvested, So, which is why on most hop packaging, well, let's put it this way, a superior hop packaging would make sure that there's no sunlight or air making contact with them. Some manufacturers vacuum seal the hops to get the oxygen out. This manufacturer here, which is Hop Union, actually purges the oxygen out of the bag with nitrogen so that there is no oxygen content whatsoever with the hops, which is why they have a very long shelf life. Put them in your freezer, and I've used pellet hops that are two years old out of the freezer, and you would have never known they were two years old. So uh, they actually taste fabulous. So you'll follow your recipe, and you're going to add your hops at the time that it says and in pellet hops, you would use, just like you have a steeping bag for your malt, for pellet hops, which is just a smaller version, you would typically only want to use an ounce of hops per smaller bag. If you try to use a larger amount of hops, what happens is, is the pellet hops, when they, when they, they rehydrate, they actually expand. And if you put too much hops in here, what happens is, it basically lets the outside hops get wet, but all the hops on the inside stay dry, so you're not getting extraction from the hops for your flavoring and your bitterness. Hops that are added at the beginning of the boil are called bittering additions. Hops that are added at the end of the boil, the last 15 minutes, let's say, or less, are going to be your flavor and aroma additions. When you add a hop at the beginning of the boil, it truly will boil off all the flavor from the hops. All you're left with is bitterness. It really doesn't matter almost what hops you use at that point in the beginning because you're not going to get those flavors, which is why a lot of breweries and home brewers will choose to use a hop that's high in alpha acid so they can use less of them. Alpha acid is how they rate hops. They rate them by alpha and beta acids. The higher the alpha acid in a hop, the higher the bittering potential is for that hop. Back in the day when IPAs first came popular many years ago, it was all about who had the biggest, baddest, bitterest beer out there. And it was because they were adding all these hops at the beginning to be so bitter. What the trend in IPAs nowadays is to be more well-rounded and balanced and adding a lot of hops at the very end for your flavor and aroma additions, which helps to balance out the bitterness in the beginning. So if you've noticed, or if you were somebody who said you didn't like IPAs, you know, 10 years ago, an IPA today 
for the most part, probably doesn't taste anything like an IPA was 10 years ago because people have learned and have learned to make them a better tasting all around beer, which is why they've become at least a favorite out here on the West Coast and especially, especially the Northwest, but for the most part around the world as well. So each hop has its own very unique, distinct flavor. Some hops have a citrusy flavor or aroma to it. Some hops have a, a piney flavor or aroma to it. Some are very earthy, some are floral. They're all different, which is why using, you can make the same recipe as far as your malt built is concerned. And by using different hops, you can have a totally different tasting beer just based on the hops alone. So if any of you like to drink commercial beers a lot, and you've had breweries and you've asked them what hops are, you'll start to learn which hops you guys like. Um, I'm a big fan of any hops myself, but everybody has their own taste preferences. So that's the good news. Naturally, with the style of beer that you're making, you're gonna to want to choose a hop that complements that style of beer. You wouldn't want to use a high alpha hop with a lot of flavor and aroma to make a really nice, light German style Pilsner. It would, it would ruin it basically. It wouldn't be true to style, but it would also for the most part ruin it. It would be too overwhelming for the grain bill in that. So it's always important to choose your hops accordingly uh, for the recipe that you're making. As a beginner brewer or beginner home brewer, those are things that come with time that you learn and having a recipe to follow will ensure, like I said, that you are making a beer that comes out well. A lot of home brewers will expand over time and they'll start writing their own recipes and with that will be trial and error or mistakes, I guarantee it, but that's how you learn and how and that's how you make a beer that, uh, your own. Okay, so in this recipe, it's going to walk you through at what stages the hops are added. When you, and this is going to be done, typically 60 minute boils are the, the amount of time that you would boil your liquid for. That's typically called wort at that time, it's not called beer. It's not beer until it's fermented, so at this point it's called, at this point it's called wort. W-O-R-T, it's a German word, which is why it sounds a little bit different than calling it wort. You may get a few chuckles, but no one's going to laugh at you too hard if you call it wort, but it's called wort. Okay, so at that point, you have a 60 minute boil. Some beers you might boil for 90 minutes or even longer. A lot of, a lot of uh, German styles and Belgian styles will actually boil their beer for a longer period of time than 60 minutes. Some do 90 minutes or 120 minutes. But for the most part, especially on IPAs, they'll do 60 minute boils and add their hop additions at, throughout the time. There are other times where you may add other adjuncts, adjuncts meaning other fermentables into the boil uh, to give it either a higher alcohol content. There are some breweries, especially uh, on the West Coast for their, for their IPAs, who will add dextrose or corn sugar into it to increase the alcohol content uh, and not make it too malty. Uh, so that's common. In this recipe, they're actually using something called Brewer's Crystals, which is basically maltose corn syrup um, solids that uh, would be put in there and what it does is it's not 100% fermentable but what would happen is it gives the body a little bit of mouthfeel to it too so some, some consistency in the mouth if you want to relate it to wine a lot of uh, wine drinkers will slosh the beer if that's the proper term for wine but will uh, slosh the, 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 the wine I'm sorry in their mouth around and tell you oh the body it's it's got mouthfeel this is what this would do at this point okay so once the boil is over and you're done adding your hops, some recipes will even tell you to add hops at flash out or at end of boil. That's typically you're turning your burner off and you're tossing some more hops in there, stirring it around, putting a lid on it, letting it sit for a bit. And what that does is it extracts all those flavors and aromas, but because it's not boiling, it's not adding any of the bitterness to it whatsoever. There's a lot of popular IPAs that are out there here in town, you know, Gigantic and Breakside make some fantastic ones. Uh, Boneyard out of Ben makes some, I mean, there's a lot of these things worthy, good life. My point is a lot of these guys will employ hops that flash out or a whirlpooling action. What whirlpooling action is, is or a hop back, is they'll actually transfer the hot wort through a bunch of hops, whether it be loose leaf or pellets, and it will extract, again, those flavors even more as it's being sent off to cool and go to the fermenter. On a home brewing scale, 
it's a little advanced. Uh, so most home brewers will just do it at flash out at that point. And then they may dry hop the fermenter later. And all, all that dry hopping means is that it's not getting, it's not being added to the boil. They're, they do get wet. You're adding it to the beer in the fermenter at the end of fermentation. So it, it, it's kind of misleading as they call it dry hopping, but it's just not added during the boil. And it's yet another way of giving it a very unique flavor and aroma profile from the hops without adding any bitterness whatsoever. And it, and it does taste different by dry hopping than it does, say, at the end of the boil. So it's a little bit different taste, which is why a lot of home brewers will employ one or the other or even both to have a very rounded hop profile to their beer. Okay, so once you're done boiling, here's where it's critical. Anything after the boiling point means that you can infect your beer if it's not sanitized. There are sanitizers on the market. This one just happens to be a company called Star Sand. They make a fabulous sanitizer for the home brewing market. Some commercial breweries even will use either it or other products by the same company. But it's important that whatever you put in contact with your wort at this point is, has been sanitized because bacteria at this point is the worst enemy to your beer and it loves and thrives in a nice sugary solution that's moist and dark. So it's, uh, it, it's critical at this point to make sure everything's been sanitized. That goes from your fermenter, whether you're using a bucket or a carboy. Uh, it could be the, the spoon that maybe you add, you, you make it, put in contact with it later or anything at this point, even bottling, bottles before bottling, you would want to sanitize these before your beer comes in contact with them so that you do not get an infection. That's different than the word inoculation, which is what some breweries will do and home brewers will do when they purposely will add certain strains of bacteria or bacteria cultures into their beer to create sour beers. That's totally different. They do that on purpose, or usually they do that on purpose. Sometimes it's on accident and it comes out fantastic. Most of the time, not so much when it's an accidental bacteria strain, which is why you want to control that as much as possible at that point. So what you will want to do with your beer once it's done boiling is you're going to want to cool it down as fast as you can. When you boil, you go to what they call it, you have a hot break happen, but during the cooling period, you want what happens called a cold break, where it actually helps to coagulate uh, the proteins and any of the the, the what's called trub or any leftover hops or other things that's in there. So a lot of homebrewers will steer it for a bit, put the lid on it, let it sit, and it's create a whirlpooling action basically. And by that whirlpooling action, it helps to concentrate that trub or those proteins and sediment towards the center. And then they'll cool it. Now some brewers just put their pot into an ice bath. When you have a pot this small, it works great to do it that way. If you're dealing with a very large batch that you've made, 10 gallons, 15 gallons or, or larger, an ice bath doesn't work very well. It takes too long. So at this point, you would want to use a chiller. Uh, this happens to be what they would call an immersion chiller. It's basically hooked up to your faucet, whether it be your, your outside faucet or to a sink in your house, the laundry tub or utility tub that has an attachment for it. And it's cold water going in. And it's basically a heat exchanger. And it's, it's basically pulling the heat out of, out of your hot work. And it'd be hot water coming out at that point. Um, you can recycle that water and put it into your, your bathtub or your, your uh, laundry machine if you want, but um, I guess I'm not as green as I should be and I kind of let mine unfortunately not do that. There's other, there's other forms of chillers by the way. There's plate chillers, there's, there's um, counterflow chillers, which a plate chiller is a kind of counterflow chiller, but there's different styles that are out there. At this point, you're going to then, once it's cooled down and it needs to be at no higher than 70 degrees, 65 is kind of the sweet spot. At this point, you're going to want to transfer it to your fermenter, whether that be a bucket or a carboy that you've sanitized by, by letting it sit in some sanitary solution. And you're going to want to transfer it over to your fermenter. And before you pitch your yeast, you want to take a gravity sample. Uh, a gravity sample is where you basically take it. I have this paper in there to show you as an example, where basically you've put in your, your wort in here. This is a hydrometer, which measures your gravity level of the beer. It's also going to tell you when your beer is done fermenting. Just because it stops bubbling doesn't mean it's done. It's a common mistake that a lot of people make. It's a very common mistake that home brewers back in the day used to make, which is why they had bottle bombs, aka bottles that would explode in their closet because they didn't let it ferment out all the way. This is how you prevent bottle bombs from happening. Uh, 
By knowing your, your pre-fermentation levels and your post-fermentation levels, this will also tell you your alcohol content of your beer by doing a formula and subtracting one from the other. So if you're like me and you want to know how much I should drink tonight because I have to be up early, using a hydrometer to know how strong your beer is is very important. So once you go to your fermenter, you'll pitch your yeast. Now this happens to be a dry yeast, and when you would pitch it, it rehydrates. Dry yeast, in my opinion, works wonderful. It takes it takes longer to see any type of activity or fermentation activity as compared to a liquid yeast strain, but it works wonderful. It typically will ferment or start fermenting within 24 to 48 hour period. There are some strains that may lag up to 72 hours before you see activity. Liquid yeast strain, on the other hand, you can see activity within you know six to 12 hours, but typically a 12 hour period is when you would see a liquid yeast strain start to see activity from it, start to ferment. What you'll do is you'll wait for primary fermentation to finish, and that's typically when you don't see it bubbling or maybe like down to like three bubbles a minute out of the airlock. This is an airlock which is here, and this would be filled with some sanitary liquid and have three bubbles about a minute or less. You can transfer to a secondary via a racking cane or auto siphon where you would pump your beer out and transfer it to a secondary vessel. So if you had fermented in here first, you would transfer it, say, to a carboy second and you put an airlock on that again, keep in mind, sanitize it. Once it's done sitting there for a week to two weeks in secondary, test your gravity levels and most likely at that point you are ready to, for, uh, to bottle at that point. It's, a, it's important when bottling to go to, a, to secondary fermentation. That's how you get rid of all that sedimentation that's actually in your beer or that, that would be in your beer. After you're done in secondary, you'll want to actually bottle your beer there is a, a bottle filler that you, you can use to attach to an auto siphon that you would actually fill this up and you're going to fill it up to about right here uh, to leave a little bit of head space and then you have your caps and you simply just cap your beer. There's different style of cappers. This is a, an Emily Wee capper and it's done just like that. Let it sit for about two weeks at room temperature. Actually I take this back. Before you bottle you are adding some priming sugar and you're actually dissolving that into your to a bucket that you would bottle out of, so it dissolves into solution. You would bottle, and then after about two weeks, you would actually have carbonated beer at that point. Maybe a little longer than two weeks. That's why you always take one bottle, put it in the refrigerator, test one bottle instead of all of them. So, and at that point, enjoy. Well, thank you. That's the end of our presentation, and we uh, hope that uh, we've sparked some interest in home brewing. And please stop by and see us at the Oregon Brew Crew.